We're standing outside Mizrahi Bookstore, which is like the Mecca, pardon the analogy, of Jewish bookstores. But what's so exciting about Mizrahi is not just the books, but the people, the culture all around it. We're here with my dearest friend, Yisrael Mizrahi, and one of my oldest friends in the whole wide world, Shimon Steinmetz. He literally, just walking by, this is Mizrahi Bookstore, these are the people around it. Brace yourselves, we're about to go in one of the most incredible bookstores in the entire world. Brace yourself. Our series, Show and Tell, will take you inside some of the great libraries, both public and private, to explore books and treasures from Jewish history. Hi there. Okay. Holy smokes, okay. It's very cozy. Super cozy. Is there an order here? Is there is there a method to the madness? Definitely an organized chaos. Every, Alphabetized? Everything yeah. is cataloged. <laughs> it's a pretty straightforward system. I just mark down where it is and you pray that nobody moves it. Generally it works. Once How long have you had this store? Here almost 15 years now. 15 years. Yeah. It doesn't take long to fill it up clearly. It's three floors of similar nature and a little bit more. Why did you start collecting and selling rare books or books it's not i mean it's not all rare correct i, I wasn't really planning on this i, I got what married was plan a what you i think? got married Accounting? i had a lot of books i i, I wasn't <laughs> yeah i wasn't thinking that far ahead i was young i was 20. a friend offered me uh, his grandfather's library he knew i knew some books i bought it i made some money off it and one library led to another uh, before you know it, you're 10,000 books in, 20,000 books in, and there really is no retirement plan. Like, what do you do with your books? How do you gradually close it? So you just stick around. And before I you think know that's it, why so many people visit, just in case they, they want to be written into the Arusha. It's very, yeah. very likely. It's, <laughs> How many uh, books do you have in total? Right now, it's about 500,000. Half a million. And I, uh, despite what it seems like, I am very selective at this point. If something, <laughs> if something comes in, I, I have a, I definitely only, have a customer in mind. Only, <laughs> I, uh, you'll be surprised. I mean, I don't take any of the really basics anymore. Right? Like every house, I do two or three house calls a night. Everyone's gonna have a Rambam, Shulchan Aruch, a Mishnah Bura, you know, Gemaras from We're the good. school. We're good. We have one. So I'm, I'm good with that, and I try to discourage uh, taking these things because then I end up just dealing with somebody coming with a school list. Well, when you say really a house call, that. just explain, what so do you mean somebody by Somebody passes away, somebody's moving. Uh, it used to be people in Brooklyn stayed in the house until they passed away. And then I would get a call. Lately, it's been a lot of people retiring and then mm -hmm. moving to Lakewood or Five Florida, Towns or Florida, Florida or Israel. So that that sort of thing. But, and they but, say, I and got all these books. too, with synagogues closing down. You know, we, we, you can live in, in Flatbush or Lakewood and think that Jews just are always here and always going to be here. But Jews are very nomadic and there are places where there, there were shuls in every corner where there's nobody left now. And something has to happen to those uh, synagogues, to their books, to their Sifra Torah, etc. So I, I they get a lot you. of calls and you, like that. And when you buy, you're not buying individual books. You usually I'm buy just, the whole library. Correct. It will be a collection. One shot. Yeah. Okay. Mostly because it's time consuming to have individual uh, negotiations. So it's, gotcha. uh, it, and thankfully, I have way more book offers than I can handle. So if it gets complicated, I generally leave it for somebody else. This is no. It feels like you're standing on on you know, like a, a thousand a thousand libraries. It's not one so library. that Jewish books is an interesting thing because we have a long history of printing, but the places and people and all these everything everybody involved in all the the making of these books are long gone. And the only thing that is left often are, are these books. So the books tell a story of, of entire peoples, entire communities. There's absolutely nothing left to some of these places, even places within the U.S. I mean, every town in New England had a Jewish community and they had a local synagogue bulletin. Where are these things today? There's no record of it. Uh, we don't even know where these synagogues existed. So anytime I get any piece like that, I try to put it together and get it to somewhere that would preserve it. Mm -hmm. So show us, let's, let's... I'll show you something, for example, that you can, f you know, that just chanced upon in a house in, in New York. So I, I bought a few thousand books from this uh, collection. The person passed away. He was a customer of mine prior. So he had a, a large pile of sheet music. So this is sheet music, Yiddish theater, uh, Chazanas, uh, sort of thing that was published in New York in the beginning of the 1900s. But when I looked at it, it turned out it had a much deeper history here. 
First of all, this specific one is an interesting one. It's an elegy to the Triangle uh, Shirtwaist uh, Factory fire, fire victims. Sure. There were, of course, uh, plenty of Jewish uh, so people. This is like a mournful Jewish song women. to commemorate that loss. But this actual copy and these markings, if you look carefully, you can see what it says here is Ghetto Bichirai Theresienstadt. So these sheet music were actually in the Theresienstadt ghetto. The Theresienstadt ghetto, as most people would know, was a... Uh, sort of a front that the Nazis created a concentration camp that was to show the world that it's not we're taking a, good care of them. Yeah, so they brought the Red they Cross and foreign dignitaries, etc. Uh, but these, uh, so we know there are books written. There's a full book written about music in Theresienstadt, a book written about the library there. That there was for a while a full operating library. There was a musical performances, and people came to Theresienstadt thinking they were just relocating. So they brought the music with them. They're their musical instruments and to lure them. them in and give them so the somehow, sense of yeah it was just so an this illusion is the sheet music that so they were using actually there in Theresienstadt that's incredible so it's yeah I mean it's uh, it's pretty amazing that somebody th had the sense to take this after the war it might have been I don't know how it survived the person who this uh, came from is gone I can't ask him but he was born in the B camp so it's possible somebody in the family I don't just wow. took it or you know a U.S. soldier maybe took it. But some things just ended up in the U.S. and uh, made their way to private homes, and the key is just to find it in time. What's the best find you think you ever had? Where you're like you bought a library, and you're just thinking you're going through, and you're like, "Wow!" I mean, it, it happens less today. Yeah. It's it's not because people are aware, and it's a good thing. I'm also in an interesting position. If somebody is calling a bookstore to sell something, they're ready of the opinion that something's worth something. They're it's more likely to find something worth a million dollars in Seamus than to find it in somebody's basement. Because it has but to what's be like the a situation. Find? To me, it's what's the finds it? that are things that are important, uh, but not necessarily the, the most valuable. There's a lot of things that I, that I found that are just uh, important historically. But, uh, give me an example. Give me an example. This is something, something that I'll give you. Important and valuable. So I'll give you an <laughs> example. So I bought, a, I bought a library, and within it was a copy of a German book published by the Nazi government with a list and descriptions that they published internally, and it's stamped for eternity use only, of the Jewish community in American Canada. And this was like a uh, planning stage for what they're going to do with American Jews when they get there. Uh, this copy was actually owned by a Holocaust survivor. He bought it at auction many years ago. Uh, it became part of his collection. And the copy that I had had a book plate of Adolf Hitler. Actually, Hitler's own copy You're of kidding. their plan. So this was a, a amazing piece. And you know you something like that. Then. So I did sell it to the National Library of Canada. And they have a great young librarian, uh, Michael Kent. So this and belonged he, to Hitler's you know, library. He got, a, he got excellent exposure for it. He made a press conference. He got it on on. 20 and different where did you find it this was part of a very large collection that i bought the collection was maybe thirty thousand books but you weren't expecting to find this, this specifically i wasn't expecting to find wow. but he must have known he had it but there was i mean it was a very fine collection and a lot of good things came out of it but he was able to get you know probably 50 news articles about the subject just to get exposure to the idea that people forget that really we're all holocaust survivors the nazis had a plan for the united states they already their, their method of operation was to come into community, find the local organizations that would have had list and, and knowledge of where the Jews were and take control of the organizations and, f and wow. from there. So this is just something that was sitting in somebody's house that, it, you know, it's a whole narrative, it's a whole story. historical importance. Let's see so what these we are just, here. just some fun stuff, the types of things that, like I said, like tell the story more than the actual book. So this is a Safer. Uh, it's a, uh, published in 1860s or so. It's a... Uh, pretty obscure saver, but it's just an example of something that we forget today in the free world is of censorship. So we know the in this Christian search, uh, church were you know, heavily censoring things that were affecting uh, uh, religion or a lot of times modesty, things that they didn't like, uh, but we also had government censoring. So this, this for example, was uh, censored by the Russian government. Uh, we know the names of the censors generally, they signed the names in the back. Uh, but uh, as opposed Who's to the censor here, it is signed here. Uh, I don't recall the name offhand, but it's he signs uh, and generally they write the dates and that's the seal that it was okay. So anytime the book the book was published in Germany of today, and anytime you had to cross over the border, it would still have to go through the the censor. So the Russian censorship was intense. I mean, they actually rolled tar. They had a tar roller that would roll over the text. It looks like the Mueller report. It will never. 
you know, Do you know what they're taking out over so here? I, yeah, I did find another copy. This one happens to be interesting. It's marital issues. Apparently, whoever the censor was was a little bit uh, finicky with her stuff. He didn't want anything that's you know, related to issues uh, to be in. A, marital a, intimacy yeah. or those things. Right. So he, uh, yeah, so the Italian censors generally that's just went over hand. with ink. So the ink generally would fade, but if it's tar, it'll probably be here forever. But, um, yeah. Fascinating. That's why. Okay. So here's just another, uh, we can just, just a small away. thing that's, you know, again, not necessarily worth a fortune, but to me it was exciting. It's a Pirkeovus uh, Pirush, written by a Rav. Uh, it, this is his shiurim that he gave in the year 1928. And it's, uh, he was the Rav in a small town. He writes here, in Auburn, Maine. Now, Auburn, Maine today doesn't really have uh, much going on in the Jewish show is seen. Uh, the synagogue it was based at Beit Avram. It was founded in 1902. At the time, there were Russian Jews there, there were uh, Polish Jews there, and they had a full operating uh, shul. I found uh, from elsewhere, by chance, a, a run of their news, uh, the newsletter published by the synagogue from this period, and they had two minyan and chakras. They had a late Marev going on. So these are, you know, real Shomer Torah mitzvahs that lived in New England. Every town in New England had a community like this that was, you know, Shomer Shabbos and they had learned every day. They all had their societies for Ein Yaakov and Mishnah Yisrael, or here it's Pirkei Avos. And there is uh, very little, if any, memory of these places. But here we have a full, real Lamda Shapirish on Pirkei Avos that uh, existed and survived. And it just ended up in somebody's storage unit. And My grandfather's a rabbi in Portland, Maine. Well, Portland, yes. it was a little bit of a uh, yeah. bigger uh, scene. But yeah, but all these places, right? So you, you came in today to your returning items. Uh, in this case, I'm returning, but not because I was dissatisfied. Uh, <laughs> more because, um, well, Yisrael, uh, um, let me take a couple of things home to look at it for further, uh, um, further research. And... I am then returning it. Okay. <laughs> yes. What do you got here? Uh, well, this is very interesting because there probably are not too many copies of this in the world. This is a kosher food guide from the OK Laboratories from 1937. One of the really cool things about Mizrahi books is that he's got just endless amounts of these things that, you know, this might be the only copy in the world um, that really tell lots of stories about history. I mean, this kind of uh, tells us about an era when there was no organized cautious industry in America. Um, people were still trying to feel out, you know, how to observe kosherus. Is it going to be, uh, you know, through looking at ingredients or just having a general feel? And uh, the OK was a... Um, this is the original, like, the, the, what we associate now with the OK. Yeah, yeah, it's a successor. The it's not run by, by this yeah. original guy. And it was really just one person named Abraham Goldstein, I believe. Sure. Um, who, uh, who created, um, like, a scientific laboratory and a scientific... He advocated to bring chemistry and science be, into food analysis. Exactly, kosher. into kosher, which uh, historically, you know, wasn't really part of it. It was all... Uh, yeah. wasn't really? I mean, it was all chazakas, and it was all kinds yeah. of things that didn't involve looking under a microscope. But uh, he brought that in, and he was controversial from, uh, from the rabbinic side. <laughs> um, Let me ask you. Yeah. I always need to ask, and you're comfortable if I ask these questions. Yeah, yeah. How much is this worth? I mean, how, how do you price something like this? Like what? It, there is no firm prices with these things, but uh, I've, I mean, it's a few hundred dollars at tops. But usually something like this would probably end up in an institution. If I have several, several libraries I work with, and if there's a book they don't have, and if it's in their field, they would want it. So show, show me what, what, what you have here. All right, so this is a bound volume of almost of four years of a periodical called Orthodox Youth, which was later... It's like uh, a teen magazine? Well... Directed for teenagers? Who's this for? It, 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 it was. I wouldn't know. I don't know if I would call it a teen magazine in the modern sense, but it was directed for young people, um, basically Agudis, people who were members of Tsiiri Agudis Israel or Benos Agudis Israel. Um, eventually was renamed to Orthodox Tribune, and in the original Mishpacha magazine, it sounds like. Yeah, in some ways, exactly. And nothing like this really existed before that. Um, it was purely orthodox. Almost all American Jewish periodicals um, were not uh, necessarily denominational. Um, and this one was trying to express the orthodox viewpoint. And there was kind of like a, through Agudis Yisrael, there was kind of like a revival in, um, 
in Brooklyn, in New York, in various other places. There was like youth movement springing up. And it has all kinds of coverage that I think much of it would be familiar today. Here, Gedolim of Eastern Europe to come to the U.S. Which Gedolim was that referring um, to? In this case, it was who? referring to people like Ravaron Cutler. Uh, although this is before Ravaron Cutler. This is December 1940. This is before. In fact, there's even a uh, page here that discusses how he's about to embark on a trip to Japan through Siberia, and it's going to be perilous. And then two months later... They say, you know, Aaron Cutler lands in San Francisco. He's, you know, he's here. It was giving you like a Rosh Yeah, like an update, exactly. Um, you know, it's full of articles of things that would become kind of like standard in American orthodoxy, but at the time were novelty. So, for example, here is a story about uh, Mr. Rosenberg, who is the, he used to be known as the Shatnas guy. And he created a... Uh, Shot like, in his laboratory. Like, he's the he, one who right. really brought this... He actually was the first person to come up with a process, or rather to utilize a process to identify linen um, in clothes using, you know, scientific test uh, chemistry. And he made it his life's passion to promote uh, the observance of shotness, which kind of didn't exist at all. Um, nobody, you know, if it didn't say linen, if it was you buying a wool suit, people assumed it was a wool suit. Uh, so here it shows him at his, uh, with his microscope, telling you all about it. And there are frequent ads in this, um, telling people, informing them about shotness and saying that uh, they'll remove it free of charge. They'll give you this, you know, this little tag that you can put in your, in your suit. It's so interesting to think about the shifts in, in American orthodoxy, where this was the period where we had to beg for observance, like it, it, we were trying to build the right. critical mass, and now, like once you have the critical mass, then it can almost serve as like a boundary for people who aren't able to reach that. This this just yeah. just showed up. So it's a set of sh it's a full set of shots published in Vienna, 1860. It's got a few things going for it off the bat. It's uh, the first time the Chassam Sofer's Haggadahs uh, were published on the shots. This happens to be a you know, people, people write on the side of the Gemaras, but sometimes they forget that other people lived in other countries and had different languages. So this one has a lot of Haggadahs, but they're in Hungarian, actually. But the interesting thing about this edition is there's a Haskemel from the Divrechaim on one the volume. Of. The, the Divrechaim of Sons. It's a really interesting Haskema. He writes the standard thing that it's a mitzvah to have it in your house. It's a bracha to bring it into your house. But he writes that the Rav of Vienna, Eliezer Horowitz, was in charge of the printing and he's keeping an eye on it making sure that there's no Chilil Shabbos while they're printing even while they're printing so that's an odd thing to say but if you understand the background what happened was there was a previous Shas published in Vienna with the Haggadah of the Vilna going for the first time in the early 1800s and the editor was Yehuda Ben Zev a brilliant linguist a Hebraist but not Shomer Shabbos in any way and the Revelation of David, of David Deutsch suspected that he was working on Shabbos. So he uh -huh. snuck in with a few of his Talmudim. Snuck in? On Shabbos to the printing press. The legend is they caught him working on the Haggadahs of the Vilna on yeah. Shabbos. He was embarrassed. He ran. He hid in the bathroom. He was 47 years old. He didn't come out of the bathroom. Now, did somebody do anything to him? Did he just have a heart attack? Did God punish he him? He died. He died in the, in bathroom. the bathroom. No children. The editor of never, this Shas. Yeah. Of this so that was... That was officially not kosher, that uh -huh. shot. So this is a new attempt by the Rav of Vienna to and make, a, make kosher a point shot. that so we didn't work on this That's where the Dibra Chaim is telling you, this one is a Shomer Shabbos wow. edition of Vienna. So you have plenty of Hasidim, for example, that would not, that banned that edition, but this would be the Frumer edition. Rav Chaim Goldberger of uh, Fulda, some Hungarian signature. And Are you comfortable with me asking? How much is this going to be worth? It's a few thousand dollars. It's not. People are uh, are surprised often that things are not as expensive as they seem, and clearly books are not sold by weight because <laughs> you've got a few hundred pounds of worth there. Okay. One of the most awesome parts about Mizrahi is the culture, the people who come in, who walk in. My dearest friend, uh, Gil student, uh, lives nearby. Baruch Hashem. What on earth do you do in a bookstore like Mizrahi? Well, you can't go browsing. You can't just go looking because it's just too much. It's overwhelming. You got to check the website, and then you got to come and you got to talk to 
uh, to the owner and find out what's new, so, what's yeah, happening. Get over here. Come here. Come here. Come. And what he's recently found that's not new, because you really want the old stuff. That's what you come here for. For the. Uh, so for give the me an example things. of something that you've purchased here. So almost impossible to find is Rabbi David Svi Hoffman's commentary on the Torah. It has. Been, it's been out of print for decades. That's right. And uh, and it, it, the minute he gets it, it, it sells off, flies off the shelf. So you got you to constantly check and you got to ask. Two in the van now. Oh, you got two in the van now. <laughs> People <laughs> run over as quickly as you can. Uh-huh. So those are the stuff that you pick up. The, the things that you're not going to find in your local, neatly furnished bookstore. If I can find it in a regular bookstore, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy it here. Even though it will probably be more affordable. So if you're looking for affordable books, you can come here as well. Uh, but also if it's online, I don't, I could just get it online. I want the stuff that's not yet online, not on Hebrewbooks.org. And there's so much out there that's really uh, important historically and can add to my learning that uh, I can only get here. There's no, no other place that I know of. I love it. I love it. Okay, that's great. So this is, happens to be super rare. It uh, has Jewish content, though it's not necessarily a Jewish book, but any American would know what it is. This is the, the very first Congress of the United States was in 1776. So this is the journals of the proceeding of Congress. So this would be the very first uh, proceedings and it's a record of what was going on. The capital at the time was Philadelphia. The British were coming towards Philadelphia. The Congress eventually moved the capital towards Lancaster. And in the meantime, he published, the printer writes that he published 80 copies. He sold 80 copies. The rest of the copies, he says, they had to um, take and use the paper for cartridges for, for the rifles of the army. So only 80 copies survived. The rest they had to use that material for for the military. cartridges. Yeah. yeah. So there was a, a shortage of paper, and uh, you know, it's a, all it is 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 a dis the, the actual uh, discussions that happened in Congress. But uh, believe it or not, there were there were several Jews mentioned. Even even though there were only you know maybe a few thousand Jews in the U.S. at the time, there were several very prominent uh, uh, people. The Gretz family. There were two brothers, uh, Michael Gretz. Who, uh, who was mentioned here, he was uh, born in Prussia. Uh, he was a prominent businessman, and he, uh, he supplied and lent money to, to the Revolutionary Army. Uh, so he, uh, he was uh, discussed here with his negotiations with the Indians. But uh, this is something, for example, that the only uh, sale record I found was about $35,000. So wow, so this is where, yeah. Huh? So it has a value you know, for, from the American historical sense, but of course it has Jewish content as well. Where did you get this? A house in Connecticut, a rare, Stanford. Did they know they had this? Yeah, I mean, they, they called Sotheby's first. Uh, Sotheby's took a few books, and then I, I paid service money for it, but it's, a, it's an interesting story also. So here we have a tshuva on the subject of Erevin. A responsa. A responsa written by Moshe Feinstein. Wow, an original. It's an original tshuva. So, of course, uh, the tshuva was published, and you can see this. Generally, what would happen is a Rav would write a tshuva. He would try to keep a copy for himself. Even Rishonim, we have records of them keeping copies for themselves. That's how we have, you know, tshuva saritva or tshuva sarashba, because they kept a copy for themselves and then gathered it together for their talmidim, etc. But you can sort of see into the mind of the publishing process. So this seems to be the copy they used for printing. Not Printing the, the actual Igris yeah, Moshe. Because you write, they write the Simanim here, and you can see the Moshe crossed out what he decided not to include in the printing, and some notes to add in here and there. A little bit of a wow. corrections. So you can. How did you? How did you get this? Where? How did this come to you? I mean, it came from one collector to another, but to, this was again most likely the copy that was given to the printer. And at some point, I guess it became either the printer's copy, because the family, I think, still has their own copies, and the recipient of the layer would have still had his copy. And how much is this worth? I said, there are much as chuvas today are between 1,000 and 2,000 a page. A lot of times with chuvas, it goes by page, so the longer the chuva, the more expensive it will be. And the subject matter is always uh, helps if it's an interesting subject. The Erovind Human is, you know, much is one of his uh, uh, more famous. Uh, fields and um, I sold one for example to a customer okay. of mine who framed yeah. it yeah. four pages with a picture of a mice in the middle it's in his dining room beautiful it's as great as you can get I mean, to have something like that in your house it's you know it's as close as you can get to somebody who's no longer here this is a group of letters uh, that was in you know somebody's uh, house in Borough Park and it's uh, letters written 
uh, to and by this organization of Sabbath observers and civil service. So this is 1940s, and you had Jews in the U.S. Army, naturally. And the organization is trying to assist with people to keep Shabbos during, it's during wartime. So it's letters back and forth from the army, sometimes with success, sometimes with uh, less success. The army writes back to them once, you know. It, in, in other words, it's pikuach nefesh, we can't really help you with this. But uh, this is at a time where, where even private people, you know, keeping Shabbos was a, was a real issue. And here is a, a letter written to Governor Dewey trying to uh, Saturday school sessions bill. So this was a organization that was committed to just helping people keep Shabbos. Keep Shabbos. It's just as you know, some yeah. basic rights that we have today were definitely not uh, given. Here are postcards written by soldiers to what the organizations. These are, Sorry, these are actual, dealing with Shabbos yeah. observance. So they have issues, you know, they're trying to get them to intervene. Uh, one one woman was fired as a secretary in an army office for not willing to work on Shabbos. And what was the name of this organization? Sabbath Observers in Civil Service. Sabbath Observers in Civil Service. I tried my best. I could not find the record of these people. It is, again, A.B. Goldstein. I don't know if it's the same Goldstein From as the OK. okay. It, we could not figure out. It, the, ad the address... Uh, seems to be associated with Mr. Radio Abe City Goldstein, Synagogue. Goldstein, care of Sabbath <coughs> observers in civil service. You have to come to Mizrahi to really believe it and soak up not just the books, not just the people, but the entire world that are preserved in this library. A one-of-a-kind place, a one-of-a-kind person. Israel Yisrael Mizrahi, what an incredible bookstore. Thank you. You're welcome to come. And the, the idea is to, to experience the books not just the content in them, the stories that they tell. Every book here had a previous owner. Some of these people are famous, some of them not, but they all had these books. They meant something to them. Oftentimes, it's many, many people. It could have been owned by communities, by libraries that are no longer in existence. And everything that we can keep and preserve for another generation is really uh, something that would not survive without us. So it's a, it's a mission, and it's a, it's, at the same time, it's enjoyable. So welcome to come. Incredible. What an incredible place.